Hi guys, welcome back to A Case of Econ Struggles. Welcome to another sequential market equilibrium struggle. This is part five where we're going to start adding the government in into our model. We're going to start talking about fiscal policy equilibrium. So timestamps are below if you would like to jump around, but let's get started by talking about what I want to do in this video. So what I want to do in this video is I just want to review the setup that we've done in part four. I'm going to derive the Euler equation in this new equilibrium with fiscal policy. And then I'm going to relate QT to RT. And all that means is I'm going to relate the price of the bond to the price of the asset. And I'm going to show that they have to be equal. And I'm going to talk about intuitively why it makes sense that they're equal. And then we're going to find all the government policies that are feasible in this equilibrium. So that's what we're going to do. And let's get started by just really quickly reviewing the setup from part four. In part four, what we had is we had Bill and Dave, our normal people. They have a utility function, which is just the natural log of their consumption. Again, everything is in terms of coconuts. But now we have Aaron. Aaron represents the government. And so Bill and Dave have to pay taxes to Aaron or to the government. And the government or Aaron can issue bonds. And just to make it easy, we're going to say that the only person in this economy who can hold those bonds is Dave. So all government bonds flow through Dave. And so what's going to happen? is that if Aaron wants to give a bond or sell a bond to Dave, then Dave has to pay a price QT to have a bond tomorrow, or BT plus one. Now Bill and Dave can still trade assets between the two of them, so we'll still call that AT plus one, and we'll call the price of the asset RT. So that's what's happening. Bill and Dave each have an endowment, and we're gonna keep that endowment the same as we've sort of been doing where Bill gets seven coconuts in the even periods and one coconut in the odd, and Dave gets one coconut in even periods and seven coconuts in odd periods. Now, if we derive an equilibrium, it's gonna look exactly the same as the sequential market equilibrium that we've seen before, where the only difference is now we have both assets and bonds, so these are the bonds that Dave can hold. For prices, we have both the bond price and the asset price. And again, we're trying to solve both Bill and Dave's utility maximization problem, we have market clearing, which is a goods market. And now our asset market looks a little different because before we said that the assets have to be equal to zero, but now they don't have to be equal to zero because government bonds sort of cover the difference. And so now the sum of our assets has to be the value of the bonds. And so we have this asset market clearing condition right here. Again, if this is a little confusing, go back to part four and just watch part four again. And if it's still confusing, leave a comment on either that video or this video, and I will try to write a longer explanation or maybe do an extra video to try and explain it more clearly. Now, let's go ahead and start finding this Euler equation. So I'm going to start with Bill's problem. Really, this is Dave's problem too. The only difference is that Dave has some bonds. But if we ignore that for a second, just to make it a little easier on us, then what you can see is that if we have this Lagrangian, we can take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to CT and AT plus one, and we're gonna get our normal first order conditions. This is the normal first order condition we're used to seeing for CT, and I just took it forward one period for T plus one. And then of course, our Lagrangian, our first order condition with respect to AT plus one, gives us this equation right here, which we can use to relate today and tomorrow. So I'm just gonna plug those in. And just like before, we're going to get that our asset price has got to be equal to beta because we're going to have perfect consumption smoothing. Again, if I went pretty quickly, if you look at part two of this series, I think that'll be really helpful when we talk about making this Euler equation and why beta has to be the price of the bonds. But if it's still confusing, again, leave some comments and I'll try to explain it in a little more depth. Now that we've done all of this setup, I want to really show you why the price of the bond has to be equal to the price of the asset. I think that's the other way around. Why the price of the asset has to be equal to the price of the bond. And intuitively, what it is, is it's just preventing arbitrage. Because for example, if the price of the bond was higher than the price of the asset, then Dave would basically not do any bonds. He would just borrow from Bill. And if the price of the asset was bigger than the price of the bonds, they would take on a whole bunch of government debt in order to get a bunch of assets from Bill, and he would make money just by substituting bonds and assets. We don't want that. We want there to be no arbitrage. There should not be an advantage. Should not be able to make money just based on borrowing some assets to get some other assets. It shouldn't work that way. And so we need to prove this. And the only way that we can relate these two prices is by summing the budget constraints of Bill, Dave, and the government. So that's what we're gonna do. 
then we're going to use a couple not hard math tricks, just something that you have to think about. I'll try to explain those intuitively as we go, but let's just get right into it. So I'm just going to take Bill's budget constraint, Dave's budget constraint, and Aaron or the government's budget constraint, and I'm just going to add them together. And I'm going to try to do this color coding so that's easy to see. And the reason I want to sort of mix and match is because I want to use some market clearing conditions to make this equation a lot easier. So for example, both Bill and Dave have their endowment in their budget constraint. So I'm just going to put those together. I'm going to put their assets together. Both of them pay taxes, so I'll just call it taxes. And then this is their taxes right here. Here's their consumption. Here's the assets. Again, where I've just summed these and pulled out the RT. So take a look at this for a second. See if this makes sense to you. If something doesn't make sense before I start canceling, please leave a comment. Please let me know that it's not clear. And I'll try to make that clear in the comments when I reply. So now that we have this written out, let's use some of our conditions to cancel some things. So for example, for the market clearing condition in the goods market, I know that the endowment must be equal to the consumption. So what I can do, is I can just cross this out because those should be equal to each other. I can also cross out taxes because it's on both sides of the equation. And now what I can also do is I know from the asset market clearing condition that this is true right here. That's just the asset market clearing condition. So I can take this out right here like that. What I can also do is if I can write the asset market clearing condition for time t, which is right here, I can also write it for t minus one, which I've done right here. And that's gonna be important in just a second. So now if I just take my simplified equation, I have bt is equal to at plus atd. And all I'm gonna do is multiply both sides by qt minus one because I want to use this asset market clearing condition in yesterday's period. And if I wanna use it in yesterday's period, I don't have BT, I have QT minus one times BT. So I need to multiply both sides by QT minus one. So I'll do that. And that means that what's gonna happen is this guy is equal to this guy, just again by multiplying by QT minus one. But I know it's also equal to this guy right here. And so the only way that this is going to work, if you look at just these two parts of the equation, the only way this works is if QT minus one is equal to RT minus one. And that means that if RT is equal to beta, then QT has to be equal to RT, which has to be equal to beta. Now I've just shown that the prices for both the government bond and the asset or the one period asset have to be the same and they have to be beta. And so I realize there's a lot of math that went into this. Again, if it's not clear, please leave a comment. Please let me know. And then the last thing I want to do in this video, now that we know what the price of this bond is, is I want to talk about the feasible government spending policies that we can use in this equilibrium, because that's going to be useful again when we bring this equilibrium all together in the next couple of videos. So what I'm going to do, similar to how we did the sequential market equilibrium with the assets where we used the budget constraint in period zero, and then we looked at the budget constraint for period one and plugged that back into the budget constraint for period zero and sort of part two or part three of the sequential market series, we're gonna do the same thing. So here's Aaron's budget constraint in period zero, and I don't know what B1 is, but if I use the budget constraint for period one, I can figure out what that is, and then I don't know what the B2 is, so I can use the budget constraint for Aaron in period two, and it's just gonna go on and on and on. And so if I substitute back, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get that it's 2T, Q0 times 2t plus Q1 times 2t plus Q2 all the way, all the way. And so you can see I'm going to get this sort of series where what's going to happen is I'm going to get the sum from t equals 0 to infinity of 2t times the product of q's. So for example, in the first term, I don't have any q's. In the second term, I have q0. In the third term, I have q0, q1. In the fourth term, I have Q0, Q1, Q2, which is just what this is representing. Maybe I'll just highlight that, which is what this guy is representing right here. And then I'm gonna be left with the last period or the period plus one times all the Qs. So that's what this guy is going to be right here. Now what I can do is I can say that, well, if this is bounded, if beta is well behaved, which beta is because beta is less than one, and I know that beta is equal to QT, then what's gonna happen is this term is gonna go to zero. So I can just rule that out. And then what I can do is I can use my geometric series rule on this guy here to say that B0 
where the number of bonds that I need to issue in period zero is just 2t over 1 minus beta. And so that's the feasible government policy that I can use. And that's what we're going to use again as we go through and solve for the rest of this equilibrium. We'll keep going, but if these videos are helping you out, please like this video. Please leave a comment letting me know, letting other people know, helping push this video to other people. And if you haven't already, please subscribe, and we'll see you next time for another case of Econ Struggles.